Well, hello, everybody. Pastor Joel here one more time for the past days with Pastor Joel. And this is a really exciting video because this is actually my very first interview. This is something I've wanted to do for a while and just didn't really have the technology to do it. Um, but I think this is going to work great. And uh, we have just a wonderful guest, somebody that I probably first got to know maybe even three years ago, somewhere in there. And as I was coming to some different understandings of how to look at the scriptures, particularly in the area of end times, but which which influences a lot of the Bible, I would sometimes read books and then I would contact the authors. In this case, I came across this gentleman's YouTube channel and he had just done some amazing teaching and work. And he's located in um, Spokane, Washington. I'm going to let him tell you a little bit more about himself, but um, just really excited to have uh, my friend and someone who's been so generous with this time and knowledge, Bruce Gore, with me today on the video. So thanks, Bruce, for being willing to do this. My pleasure. Nice to be with you, Joel. And I guess this is always a, you know, a good thing to start with, but maybe a little a little thumbnail sketch. And this this can be about theology, but it can be about whatever. Who is Bruce Gore? Well, uh, it's a real short story because I've got a pretty boring life, you know, but uh, grew, <laughs> up in a, grew up in a little rural town about 100 miles from Spokane, which is where I now reside. Grew up in a little Baptist church, actually, in, uh, in that uh, area, very conservative. And, but I've never, uh, I've never been unhappy about that. It was a wonderful background, lots of Bible stories, lots of great Sunday school teachers. And so my earliest recollections uh, have been a life of faith, a life of being uh, act actively involved in church, that kind of thing. And wound up going to uh, college here in Spokane at Whitworth University. Graduated back in 1972. Uh, and when I graduated, I was interested in broadcasting. So I actually was in the broadcasting world for a while, both Christian and secular radio announcing, that kind of thing. Uh, but a little Bible school opened up in Spokane along the way. And I uh, went in thinking I, I could teach speech. You know, I was doing a little bit with uh, uh, broadcasting. And I thought that'd be a way to not only uh, teach something, but take some classes and that job gradually morphed into a full-time faculty spot. Of course, that's not too impressive because this was a very small fly-by-night Bible school, so it didn't uh, it didn't necessarily mean I was reaching the uh, upper echelons of academic excellence there. But <laughs> but it did kind of serve as my uh, poor man's seminary to have to teach church history, theology, Bible. I taught Romans uh, seven straight years, church uh, hermeneutics, you know, all of the classes you might normally take in seminary. I had to teach. Uh, to, do, uh, to these uh, students. Of course, most of these students were pretty new to the faith, so it wasn't as if this was high-level academics, but it was a good experience for me. <clears throat> Gradually, over the time, the, the school that I was teaching at was very committed to a dispensational outlook. We're living in the end times. Hal Lindsey was a big name. Uh, the rapture is about to happen. You know, the Antichrist is on his way, and that was in the early, that was in the early 70s. And at the time, I actually believed that. I was pretty committed to that. But interestingly, teaching at the school uh, continued to loosen my mortar uh, to the point that I became very gravely concerned about whether or not this was actually the right way to view things. I was surprised to learn that a dispensational outlook was fairly recent in church history, that none of the great thinkers in history had ever heard of it, you know. Calvin never heard of it, Luther was unaware of it. Augustine didn't know anything about it. Uh, Thomas Aquinas never came across it. And it seemed like something so powerfully formative in the way we view scripture would have uh, come across the radar at some point along the way. And uh, it never had. And I became a little concerned about that. And, and of course, teaching the book of Romans and other New Testament documents uh, also created a lot of loose ends that I couldn't really quite correlate with the dispensational outlook. So eventually, uh, I, I finally had to part company with the school on very amicable terms. In fact, I spoke at their graduation in 1980, but be that as it may, I had to say goodbye and needed a job. So I went to law school and became a lawyer and practiced law in Spokane here for quite a few years. Always teaching on the side. I taught in the adjunct faculty out at Whitworth University and here and there in my church and so on. And uh, retired from law uh, oh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. 
Uh, but also during the last few years, I was teaching at a little classical school here in Spokane, high schoolers, uh, and retired from that just a few years ago as well. So right now I'm a retired guy. Uh, and uh, that's uh, it's the Lord has been very good to me and given me a lot of opportunity to continue uh, being involved in teaching a lot of it online now. And, and uh, that's how I came across someone like you. And it's been an honor to to get acquainted with you. So uh, that's kind of the story. That's uh, that's where we are these days. So do you have uh, just before we get into the theological stuff, because we'll certainly do that. Uh, many hobbies, things you really enjoy doing these days. Well, you know, uh, over the years, I had a, a lot of things that I did. I, I've never been an athlete, so I can't put golf on the list or anything like that. But I, uh, I learned to fly. I was an instrument rated pilot when I was practicing law. I flew around to the Northwest here and there. And um, I've always been interested in computers. So that kind of helped me get past the technology involved in, in creating and editing videos and writing software. So I have a pretty robust uh, uh, kind of uh, website that uh, will teach people New Testament Greek. It's an interactive program, uh, <clears throat> history of the uh, historical context of the Bible uh, and various other courses that are available. This is mostly intended for homeschoolers, for people that are learning uh, at home and they need some curricular uh, um, assistance there. And so I'm, I'm not trying to provide a full curriculum, but but uh, maybe some courses that'll help spice up their uh, learning a little bit. So, you know, I've been doing that. That's probably my, the closest thing I have to a hobby these days. Well, it's probably a good idea as an, as an attorney to, to be able to fly in case you've got some clients that are really disgruntled, you can get away in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never really had to pull that card, but I, I'm not surprised to, it, it would have been good to do if I had to do it. So, <laughs> you know, have that in my back pocket. Well, well, where and and um, we'll probably reiterate this later. But what are the easiest ways for people to find your various teachings? Well, I'm I'm sure the easiest way is just go to YouTube and type my name in the search engine, Bruce Gore, and again, it'll that'll be the first thing that pops up. I have I think it's just shy of 700 videos on wow. YouTube. Uh, I have had 10 million views, 50. 3,000 subscribers at this point. So, you know, to me, that's astonishing. It's staggering, really. Because who am I? I'm just a guy. You know, it's not like uh, this is uh, that I hold myself out as anything special. But I think there's just a hunger uh, for certain kind of information that I hopefully can provide. Uh, so I've got people all over the world that correspond with me. I, I'll upload a video today and hear from somebody from Uganda tomorrow. You know, it's that kind of thing. So, it's been very satisfying, uh, a real blessing. I, I give Jesus all the praise for that. It's certainly no great uh, shakes on my part, but it's been a wonderful uh, kind of privilege to be a, a kind of a pastor, I guess. I'm not ordained. I don't call myself a pastor, but I think to some people in some parts of the world, I've been playing something like that role, and so that's been an honor. Well, and just and just so everybody knows that are that people that listen to me, um, I've been able to to email several times with Bruce, had several phone conversations, and then I got to meet him in person in Spokane, Washington, uh, somewhere around a year ago, somewhere in there. And the the humility is not just something that he's you know saying to to try to sound <laughs> humble on a video or something. It's it's a real. Uh, in fact, when we met in Spokane, I remember we were talking at some point, and I was just thanking you for a lot of your content because literally, and I and I may mention this maybe a couple of your particular series later, but um, it, the teaching is, is, is very profound. And I, and I have a, a handful of friends and a couple that have said that, that some of the, it's, it's primarily from your um, apocalypse and space and time series, but mm -hmm. also some other things that literally some of your teaching has changed their, their whole outlook and the way they understand mm -hmm. the scriptures. And I remember, you know, I was telling Bruce that when we met and, and he just kind of said, Oh, shucks, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. and I just, well, I still say that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But I just I love that humility and it's so refreshing because and I can be guilty of this too. You know, I, um, as much as I know I don't know, there are times when I when I think I know a lot and I there might even be something in that Bible that says something about knowledge puffing up. I'm not sure, yeah, but I think I, I first Corinthians eight, that. it's right there. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so that's something I think for for any of us, um, 
you know, Bruce, I think you're just a real good uh, model of that humility. So I appreciate that about you very much. Well, um, I did a little promo video that I, I didn't tell Bruce about, but just to let my listeners know a couple of days ago that I was going to be doing this interview because I knew they'd want to watch it. And we're, we're not live, we're recording it and I'll get it out soon. But I just for fun, and I hope I hope you're not too unhappy about being part of this list. But I I title it Antichrist, Red Heifers, Solar Eclipses, and Bruce Gore. So, <laughs> well, I'm in good company there. I appreciate <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. but, but just along those lines, and, and you mentioned um, dispensationalism, and, and a lot of people listening may be familiar with that. Um, but for those who aren't, if if you would be willing to give maybe just a brief sketch of what what that teaching is, because I, my understanding, I guess, is that in, in academic circles, more scholarly circles, that that's, that's not considered too viable anymore, but it still seems to be very prevalent, at least in a lot of the American church. And so maybe um, just what, what, what is that paradigm? And then you, you mentioned something earlier that, that may surprise a lot of people. You, you mentioned um, some very well-known Christian thinkers from history and said that, that, that they wouldn't have really known anything about this system. So can you just speak to that? What is it? And maybe just briefly trace the history of that paradigm. Sure. Yeah. Dispensationalism is a particular, I'd call it a theological model. It's a way, it's a set of assumptions that a person brings to the text and uses it to interpret various, you know, passages and themes and so on in the scripture. That in itself is not bad. I think everybody does that to some degree, but uh, this particular view uh, really originated in its in its mostly fully formed uh, expression in the early 1800s. It was uh, it was connected to what's sometimes called the Second Great Awakening, the First Great Awakening, which was largely the work of uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield in the colonial period of America, 1740s, uh, is the name you know, Great Awakening properly, but uh, about 100 years later, in the 1830s and thereafter, there was kind of a second so-called Great Awakening, which tended to be a little bit more emotional in its orientation. That is to say, uh, the real evidence of good preaching and, and repentance was a highly emotional expression. That was true in the first Great Awakening as well, but the theological core was very different in the second Great Awakening. And the one thing about the Second Great Awakening that was a dominant theme was that this expression of religious fervor was a mark that we were living in the end times. This is in 1830. Okay. And so there were a fair number of religious movements, including the Mormons, uh, to some degree a, a little later, but uh, rooted in the same time frame, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, and various other movements uh, originated at that same time. It was kind of a simultaneous explosion of a variety of religious traditions that didn't agree with each other, except that they all tended to concur that we're living in the end times. And uh, the, the benchmark date back then that was really the focus was 1844. That was called the, the year that Christ would return his failure to return, apparently, uh, since it doesn't appear that he did, uh, thereafter was called the Great Disappointment, you know, and that yeah. that was a term everybody had heard back then. Well, one of the movements <clears throat> that originated then was uh, a dispensational view of the scriptures. Uh, the man who was usually credited with formulating, it was a very bright man. He was certainly a, a competent New Testament uh, scholar, and he was very conversant with biblical information. Uh, but uh, for a variety of reasons, he, uh, he kind of formulated this end times uh, understanding of the scripture uh, along the lines of saying <clears throat> that history is divided into a series of independent eras that were called dispensations. And he borrowed that term from the Bible because the Paul himself will speak a few times of, the, of a dispensation. He uses that term that was in the original King James the Greek word oikonomia. It doesn't mean a period of time. It does mean a kind of administrative regime. But nevertheless, uh, Darby picked that up and wrote a fairly comprehensive sort of theology that, that formulated things along this dispensational view. 
the uh, core of the idea of dispensationalism is that uh, we are living right now in what in the in the, the sixth of these uh, seven dispensations, yeah. uh, and it's called the Age of Grace, and it's also called the Church Age, and it's a time in which, using the the sort of metaphor of dispensationalism, the clock has stopped with respect to God's purposes for ethnic Israel. And so when, F, when Israel repudiated Christ as their Messiah, when they crucified him instead of honoring him as their king, uh, dispensationalism says the clock stopped, as it were. Uh, and biblically, they call that the 70th week of Daniel or the week of, da of Jacob's trouble, borrowing that, for that, that 490 year period of time from, from the book of Daniel. And they say that 70th week is still in the future. And it's going to be called the, the, tri the uh, tribulation, the great tribulation, which Jesus talks about in the Olivet Discourse, which the book of Revelation mentions. And that that is going to be when God pulls the church out of the world in an event called the rapture, that there's going to be a time of upheaval called the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel. And then we'll usher in the kingdom, the, the last of these dispensations, in which Jesus will reign on earth. Uh, well, that's been very influential, especially in American <clears throat> evangelical Christianity. And even though dispensationalism is generally, I think, waning, not having the same influence that it once did, it certainly has not died. It is still very yeah. much out there. And many people are still very much uh, committed to that point of view. I just read a book not long ago, you may have come across it, Joel, that's entitled The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism by a fellow named Hummel. And he does a, a very good detached, it's, not a, it's certainly not a, an attempt to bash dispensationalism, but he does a very uh, honest assessment of its history. Uh, it's, it's really its rise to a high level of dominance. And he traces how at this point, it's in a bit of a shambles theologically but at the popular level, it still has a lot of people embracing it. No great theologians, you would say, heavyweight theologians are really still advocating it as was once the case. There was a time when some of the better thinkers, especially in American evangelical Christianity, were still pushing it pretty hard. Not so much anymore, but at the popular level, it's still out there. So, you know, the, the, sort of the end times idea that the tribulation is coming, the rise of the Antichrist, the rapture, the millennium, all of those are terms that are pretty much distinctively the province of a dispensational outlook. And that was the tradition I grew up in. I was, I just assumed that was the case. I thought if you didn't believe that, that you probably weren't a Christian. You know, I mean, I had a very kind of narrow perspective. I was shocked when I went to Whitworth College, which is a Presbyterian school, and finally, reluctantly came to understand that a person could be both a Christian and a Presbyterian at the same time. I was really, <laughs> that was, a, that was a, just a news to me, you know. <laughs> That's where I began to kind of loosen my mortar a little bit on the point. But, but it took many more years before I finally just said, you know, this is not working for me. And, and uh, I had to say goodbye to it. I hope that kind of gets at it. It's a kind of a sketchy view of what it uh, what it is. Oh, incredibly helpful. And I, and I hope for anyone listening, I hope you listen to that carefully and we'll go back to it because it's so succinct and such a good overview. And and one of the things that's concerned me a little bit, Bruce, and and you know a little of my story and th this interview isn't about my story, but I but I certainly have encountered this personally and I and I know quite a few people now uh, that basically are are anywhere theologically outside of dispensationalism because I, I consider dispensationalism Though it does, uh, its locus maybe is on end times. It is, it is a way or a framework. A way, uh, it is a hermeneutic. It's a way of seeing the, the yeah. scriptures. I think. And what I've been concerned with is, and you and you touched on this, is that for whatever reason, and and I try to separate the teaching from the people who hold to a certain mm -hmm. to a certain view, um, because I'm I'm blessed to have brothers and sisters from you know, of all of all stripes and in, in the in the kingdom, but with dispensationalism, it does seem like all these issues are tied to salvation. You mentioned them, the rapture, a certain view of the millennial kingdom, the coming antichrist, um, modern state of Israel today being God's chosen people. And it, it's this conglomerate. And, and it's for people who hold to that, you know, hard and fast, if you have a different view, it's, it's, 
it's they'll say things like it's not so much that you just have a different view of this idea, but that maybe you're not a Christian. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It does uh, reach very deeply into a person's uh, psyche. And that's unfortunate because it uh, is it becomes one of the many reasons that Christians find themselves divided from one another, when in fact we should be working a lot harder to find those things that unite us rather than things that divide us. But unfortunately, it's had that effect. Not the only thing. I mean, you know, dispensationalism is not the only culprit that has tended to uh, divide Christians, but it happens to be one that's been pretty pretty influential, I think, especially in American Christianity, although it certainly has a presence around the world at this point. So in one of my conversations with you, I think it was a phone conversation, and you... And you correct me if I'm mistaken, but you mentioned that a little letter called Galatians had a lot to do with changing your your view. Could you speak to that? Sure. I was teaching Galatians. I actually Romans was probably the most important, um, but uh, Galatians is a little more pointed at certain at a certain juncture, and and uh, uh, the text is in Galatians chapter three, in which Paul speaks of the seed of Abraham. And of course, the seed of Abraham is a rather important and somewhat technical idea in the New Testament that comes up more than once. It's not, uh, this is not just a kind of a passing reference by Paul, but this is a somewhat germane idea. And the whole debate is who are the seed of Abraham? Uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11, you might say, are organized around that question. And Paul kind of drops a bomb on his uh, audience there in Rome when he says they are not all Israel who are of Israel, which is to say just because a person has Jacob uh, as their biological uh, ancestor, uh, that doesn't mean a person is a true Israelite. It doesn't uh, make you by definition, by birth, you might say someone who can say, I am the true seed of Abraham. Uh, Paul uh, in Romans chapter two says they are not all, or he says in, uh, a person is not a Jew just because he's born a Jew. Circumcision is not simply outward in the flesh. Yes. But in in uh, in Galatians chapter three, especially Paul speaks of the seed of Abraham, and he does a little play on words, uh, and and he's doing it in te- it's almost tongue in cheek, uh, because as is the case in Greek, uh, the same as in English, the word seed. Uh, can be both singular and plural, but it does have in Greek, as in English, the possibility of being made explicitly plural, as in seeds, you know. And that's what Paul does in Galatians 3. He says, now, notice that uh, the the uh, text there in Genesis does not say uh, that the promise was to Abraham and his seeds, plural, <laughs> you know, but his seed, singular, uh, and then Paul gives specific definition. The seed of Abraham is Christ, not a multiple, you know, it's Christ. He is the seed of Abraham. He is the one specifically to whom the promises to Abraham and his seed were given. And then Paul says, we become seed of Abraham, not by birth, uh, in fact, not by any humanly uh, manipulatable uh, event, but only by faith. So those who are of faith are in Christ. He says, if you've been baptized into Christ, then you have put on Christ. Then you are in Christ in the specific sense that you can now say derivatively, you are the seed of Abraham, not because you have an intrinsic claim to it, but because Christ, the intrinsic seed of Abraham, has become your doorway into that status. Well, obviously, that means only those people who have faith in Christ can properly use that term. And anyone who does not have faith in Christ, let's say a Jewish person who, let's say, theoretically, could trace their genealogy all the way back to Abraham in an unbroken sequence. I don't know if there's anyone that can do that today, but if there were such a person, if they didn't have faith in Christ, they still are not seed of Abraham. Well, that text, I have to say, as I taught it more than once, became increasingly troubling to me. In fact, I had, I remember once I was teaching and somebody asked me the question specifically. I mean, they were too dumb not to ask it, you know, <laughs> well, the, 
then how, how if Paul says that, then how can the Jewish people claim to be seed of Abraham? And I, and I was stood there, I stared at them, and I realized this kind of blank stare I had on my face betrayed the fact that I didn't know the answer to that. That was that was a perplexing <laughs> question that, in fact, had been sort of gnawing at the back of my mind as well. And I can't say that was the turning point because I really didn't know what to turn to. But I certainly knew mm -hmm. that there was a there was a, a problem here. And I think I in, instinctively gave some bogus answer that, well, we need to keep in mind that in the New Testament, there's actually two different seeds. There's the earthly seed and the heavenly seed or some some outrageous uh, dodge of that question that that may have satisfied the student for a moment. And it certainly didn't satisfy me, but it was a way to avoid more further embarrassment. But I have to say it, it kept it kept gnawing in my mind. And, and there were other things. I mean, that was just, you know, one example, but there were others that that uh, were also equally uh, disturbing. All, Romans 9, 10, and 11 were probably the most sustained argument that I kept coming across mm. that was an argument against dispensationalism. And, and it was, uh, you know, I mean, those chapters are about God choosing. They're about God <clears throat> making a sovereign choice and saying by his sovereign will, uh, this one is seed of Abraham, uh, that one is not. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. I mean, those are hard verses. But the broader context is simply to say the question of whose seed, who is seed of Abraham is ultimately God's doing. Uh, God can raise up from these rocks seed of Abraham, John the Baptist preached. So, and, you know, the, the long and short of it is that was really what, what kind of drove a little bit of a spike into my confidence. And over time, it, you know, I, I came across R.C. Sproul back then. This was before he hmm. was really famous, but he certainly, uh, some of his cassette tapes that I listened to, and I actually met him at one point, uh, spent about an hour with him, and, and uh, uh, he was an important influence along the way. There were a variety of things that, that came along, but, but I'd say biblically, that was probably the, the heart of what gave me some heartburn about a possible <laughs> question, you know. And this is a huge issue because literally just this morning I was part of a part of a Bible study and um we were actually kind of tracing the last few days of the life of Jesus. I wasn't I wasn't leading the the study um and talked about his his sacrifice and so the, the question came up, you know, if Jesus was the final sacrifice, um and 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 several people you know were hearing about you know, even even the like even the eclipse, I think is on April eighth. That might be a big deal. And the you know, red heiferism, and then apparently the blueprint is ready and the utensils right. for the temple and all this. And so the topic came up. Well, if Jesus made that final sacrifice, <laughs> why are we bringing all these other things up? But I think that's the heart of what you said. If in fact, and I and Paul, I believe, is going back to Genesis twelve. If in fact those promises were made to Abraham and all ethnic Israelites. And they were still the chosen people in that same way. Then, in some sense, it may it, and and the prophecy clock was stopped, as you said. It may make some sense, and let let's bring that system back in. But if it was to his seed, then the way I understand that is every single person today, regardless of, of where they're from or ethnicity or anything, everyone in Christ is the inheritor of all those promises. Is that the way you understand it? That's exactly right. And with respect to the temple, I you know I. I will give you my opinion on this, so you can tell this is probably not worth much, but I, I, I believe that the temple will never be rebuilt. Um, I think that God has uh, orchestrated history such that even though I know there are people who want to do it, I know that there's plans and blueprints and stuff, you know, and all of that, uh, that any actual effort to build it is going to meet with, uh, in God's providence, a, a total failure. There's an interesting story that goes back to, the, uh, to one of the emperors in Rome after Constantine. Uh, I think, what, is it Julian? You may, I, I think it's Julian the Apostate. Is that, what, is that the, I'm, where, it was some, where, some, uh, this is after Constantine. It was probably in the 400s. Uh, yeah. There was one Roman emperor who was trying to restore paganism to Rome. Rome had become officially Christian by then, and he was a non-believer, and he was trying to drag Rome back in the direction of the pagan gods. And he actually sent a crew to go and rebuild the temple. That was his purpose. 
And the story is <clears throat> that as they attempted to do so, there was actually fire that came leaping out of the ground that prevented it. I mean, it was like a small volcano that just made it impossible to proceed. Now, I can't verify that. I wasn't there. But, I, you know, <laughs> there's, uh, there's at least uh, some uh, evidence that, that God is just not going to put up with it. The true temple is his people. It is a living temple made up of living stones. Jesus is the cornerstone. Uh, that is the true and proper temple. It used to be that we made a pilgrimage to the temple. Now the temple is making a pilgrimage to the world. Hmm. Go into the world, make disciples of the whole planet. Uh, that's, that's the trajectory of God's redemptive activity today. And I don't think, in, at least in my opinion, I can't cite a chapter and verse on this, but I just don't think that God is going to permit a competitor to his temple to be resurrected. Hmm. In, uh, in Jerusalem. So for whatever it's worth, that's, that's where I am on the topic right now, even though I know there's people that uh, would differ sharply with me and that yeah. all those plans and things are going on. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, I'd like to pivot a little bit to uh, another book of the Bible. And I've heard you say at least uh, once in your teaching, um, and this refers to Revelation, that you'll, you'll sometimes tell the people you're teaching that you want to put revelation back in people's Bible. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I, I have to say, you know, I was, like I mentioned earlier, back in the mid seventies, I was teaching. Uh, these were students who were, you know, as they say, just fresh off the turnip truck. A lot of them are just barely uh, new believers. This was kind of back in the days of the Jesus movement. Yeah. And, and so a lot of these folks had come had come to faith out of the most, uh, you know, just horrific circumstances of drug abuse and, you know, and immorality and all of that kind of the whole hippie phenomenon it, uh, was going on. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that, but I sure am. And and so a lot of these people, they weren't they weren't overly sophisticated in their biblical outlook. But uh, the. The oh, I lost your question. What well, I was, I got up. Well, tell me your question just again. Put, 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 putting putting revelation back in people's. Oh, Bible. that's right. Thank you. So you you got to keep me on track here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I remember teaching at the school, and uh, the the one book I resented the most in the Bible was the book of Revelation, because I didn't, I couldn't figure out what in the world it was about. I knew I read Hal Lindsey and Late Great Planet Earth and all of these things. And I had to say something in me said, you know, that's a stretch. I mean, the locusts of Revelation chapter nine are helicopters. Really? <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. You know, I, I just, you just have a little bit of a credibility issue there. And I think I maintained that uh, for many years after that, that I just, and I think other people felt that way. They liked the Bible, but you hit Revelation. It just was so weird. And and, uh, you know, it's just totally different from what you, at least apparently, from anything else in the Bible. I was with my wife on a, on a journey uh, in the Greek Isles in 1993. And uh, I was looking at the island of Patmos. We were going to visit it the next day. And I was looking at it kind of we were on the ship, you know, on the cruise ship uh, about a half a mile off the coast. And I was looking forward to visiting Patmos. But I just I was all by myself there, just kind of uh, contemplating all that had happened and thinking to myself, you know, I need to man up here. I need to just quit avoiding this book. I need to teach it. That's the only way I ever figure anything out is just by jumping in the deep end and, and teach this book. And so I made a little deal with myself that one year from that moment, this was like July of 1993. So the fall of 94, this was the contract I made with myself. I was going to teach Revelation. And at the same time, I made another deal with myself that in preparation for teaching Revelation, I would memorize the whole book start to finish. Uh, and, and I memorized the first verse of Revelation standing right there on the deck of that ship, you know, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And off we go. And and I tried to add one verse a, a, a day over the next year and keep intact everything else. And, and in fact, by the end of that year, I, I had memorized the book. And I have to say, it was really a life changing thing to force myself to wrestle with what's going on. One nice thing about memorizing 
is that your brain works overtime to make sense of what mm -hmm. you're learning because that's part of how you keep it in your head is by making sense out of it, some kind of, you know, rational, um, sensible uh, understanding of what's going on. And that in itself was very helpful. I came across some literature that took a more of a preterist view, as it's called, of Revelation, arguing that Revelation was really describing in apocalyptic language <clears throat> events that were well known to us that all took place in the first century. And in other words, that, that whole year was really, it, it made Revelation part of my Bible. Hmm. And I guess from that point on, I thought I would like to do that for other people. I'd like to have them no longer cower in fear or feel like Revelation maybe shouldn't even be in the canon. That's what Martin right. Luther suggested. But to really just make it part of your Bible. It's a little different genre, but it's not so mystifying that we should run in fear. In fact, the name of the book is Revelation, Apocalypse. That's mean, that means making something clear, making it visible, making it understandable. It's the very opposite of the idea of something being incomprehensible and confusing. And so that's been a little bit of my life mission since, you know, among other things, is trying to, uh, to help people feel more comfortable reading the book and having some some frame of reference within which to make sense out of the uh, images and, and symbols and so on that they run into there. Well, I love that because I found that um, there are sometimes two tacks, which is people either thinking it's, it's just so odd, you know, kind of, kind of I, you know, I don't want anything right. to do with that book. Right. And then on the opposite end, almost, almost divorcing it from the rest of scriptures. And so that it's, it's completely its own thing and coming up with, well, locusts that are helicopters, you yeah, know, that's right. Um, and so I want to ask you something because I know that um, that you teach that you teach Greek, and um, one of the things that I have encountered a fair amount, and and let's just um, keep it even, even within the first three verses of Revelation, and certainly a lot of these same Greek words are used in other places, but sometimes people refer to them as time statements or time mm -hmm. time words. Right. And so in the first verse the, in English, and most translations, it says these events are going to happen soon. I think it's um, Pakos there, and then Agus in verse three, the events are near. And uh, a lot of people will say, well, actually what that means is that once they start to happen, you know, zoom, I mean, they're gonna be really right. fast. Uh, and you, um, I know little bits of Greek, but I mean, you teach Greek. Uh, is there any possibility that those, that, that that pushback is correct? That words like soon, you know, quickly at hand, that actually they, they don't mean anything in particular at time, or, or is the Greek pretty pretty clear about that? Well, the Greek is pretty clear about that, and that's that's the that's the dilemma, one of many dilemmas that people who want to make Revelation referring largely to things way out in the future. That's one of the biggest uh, objects that they run into right off the bat, because seven times. Uh, on seven different occasions, it, it, you know, the, that statement is made that these things are about to take place. Uh, and it's stated in different ways. It's not like it's the same formula sure. uh, every time. It's stated, like you said, ingus is one of the words that usually means is about to happen, is about to, is the, the phrase. The, uh, the prepositional phrase that's used uh, a couple of times is, is in toxe. In is a preposition, toxe, uh, the dative of the word that means rapidly. Uh, and that's where people kind of grab onto that and they say, well, rapidly just means it's going to be fast when it happens, but it may not be happening right away. Uh, well, the difficulty, I don't want to be too technical in this, but, but it may be helpful. Uh, the word taxe, uh, it would be roughly in English T-A-X-E-I uh, or something like that. It would be, it would be uh, the idea of rapid, okay? That word is used in the New Testament on multiple occasions, and sometimes it does simply mean rapidly. It just means do it fast uh, without any implication that do it fast right now. It could be do it fast next week. I mean, that, that could be the meaning of the word. So that's worth noting. However, the prepositional phrase in toxe uh, limits that. Uh, and that phrase, any other time it's used in the Bible, and it's used several times, 
uh, it always quite obviously means yeah. do it right away, as in within the next few minutes or few days or whatever is reasonable given the context. Uh, it, it never just means do it rapidly without any sense of when that rapid event might take place. That's the way it's used in Revelation. <clears throat> so I think it's safe to say that if I were to you know, talk to somebody in the first century who spoke Greek, and I made a statement to them using that phrase, and I said, these things are about to happen right away in Toxe, that they would take me to be lying if I said that to them, and I actually meant it's going to be thousands of years in the future. Wow. They would think it's not just that it was an ambiguous idea, and maybe they just misunderstood me. They would understand that what I'm saying to them was an outright fraudulent statement because the way that phrase was used and was always used meant do this right away. If my wife tells me, I want you to take the garbage out and I want you to do it right away. She doesn't mean you can do it three weeks from now. Just be sure you're really fast when you do it. That's not the meaning of the phrase. And I wouldn't, and she would know I was being pretty dishonest if I took it to mean that, you know, that's, that's the meaning of the term. And that becomes almost an insurmountable hurdle for those who are dealing with revelation. It, it's complicated a bit by the fact, Joel, that many of those who are dispensational take the view that revelation was written about 95 yes. AD. And of course, if you, if you look at what happened right away, calibrated against 95 AD, you can't find really anything in the world that even roughly corresponds to what's being described in Revelation. You just, you look in vain. There's nothing that would really lead a sensible person to think, oh, that's what that was talking about within the next few years of, it, of 95 AD. So it becomes at least uh, attractive to say, well, it means, it means somewhere way out in the future, but it'll take place rapidly uh, because obviously it didn't, take place in connection with 95 AD. That's why people that take the view that I think both you and I take the more the preterist view generally would say, we're not dealing here with 95, we're dealing more with like 65 AD. Uh, and if you, if you look at what's happening in the world and the Roman empire, especially in 65 AD and the next, you know, two or three years, then the descriptions in revelation uh, really are just stunningly consistent with what takes place in the world. It becomes almost child's play to read the book and say, well, this has got to be that, to tie it to, if a person's familiar with the events, then it becomes uh, pretty plain that that's what's being described. So again, uh, you know, that, that phrase is one of many problems that, that people who had, take a futurist view deal with. But I think it's one of the more weighty problems. It, it, it poses a a rather significant impediment to that futurist view in spite of the fact that so many people embrace it. Well, I, I really appreciate you being uh, you know, so clear about that. And if anybody's noticing, I'm trying to be subtle, but I, I, I did get a cat recently and the cat is wanting to be part of the interview. So a couple <laughs> of times that. I've had to just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah that's, 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 that's Laverne, everybody. So all right. if, I, if I wanted two cats, I would have gotten Shirley too, but I just wanted one. <laughs> But I just, it's so important what, what you said. And I, I think um, I was some, I've been a believer for uh, around 30 years and um, dispensationalist for sort of my first years. And I found that's a fairly common story just because it is so prevalent, pervasive. Um, but as I, and so I certainly studied, you know, eschatology, which is the study of the end times over the years, but it was really, um, you know, a little over somewhere between three and four years ago, I started really looking at these statements and, um, and I, I get it for people that have, have just been taught one thing. It, it's a hard thing. And, and I think a lot of believers just haven't haven't been exposed to some of what we're talking about. But I feel like once once somebody is exposed to it, like you said, it, it's pretty you have to work really hard to, to make the words mean things that they don't. Right. That they don't mean. And, um, and it's so consistent. Um, I remember uh, this was another man. I don't know if you know this name. He, he died uh, a few years ago and he was only 52 or 53. Um, um, Dr. Kelly Nelson Burks. Have you come across that name? Uh, oh, I, I think I've, I think I have name recognition there and that's it. I couldn't tell you much. Okay. About that. Well, they, it's Bell. 
Yeah, at any rate, he, he came to these um, to some of these views of these prophecies being fulfilled. And, and uh, he had a series it's still available on YouTube for anybody that's interested. It's all there. No, no dots or spaces or anything. It's just Dr. Kelly Nelson Burks, probably dot dot com. And you can get to his things or, or just on YouTube. But he, he said that there are certainly different statements all throughout the New Testament that are speaking to what we think of as end times events that do not have a particular time indicator with them. But in every single case that they do, it always seems to be limited to that first century time. And I and I and, the, and I, I think you know, as I've looked at it, it's just, yeah, it's not as if there are a few times where it says you know things like soon, quickly at hand. But then other times it says well, it might be you know two thousand years in the future, and then we kind of weigh them on the balance. It's just right. they're they're pretty clear. And and I just I remember sometimes even kind of feeling foolish. But it's just what I had been taught. And and um, and sometimes the statement's put like this. Well, while the Bible is for us, it wasn't written specifically to us. And once yeah. once I think I started seeing some of those, well, of course, if you know, you know, in all of the discourse passages, when Jesus was talking to his followers, of course he was addressing them. And yet somehow I had thought that he was, you know, talking to Joel in the 21st century <laughs> America. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, that that's a phrase that is w good to keep in mind, and it it forces us to do our hermeneutics correctly, uh, which is the idea that before I try to apply any text of scripture to myself, I should do the uh, homework of figuring out how it applied, how did it play to its first audience. And that that doesn't necessarily happen intuitively. Sometimes it takes a little bit of research, a little sure. bit of you know, kind of digging in and figuring that out. But the idea that the Bible is uh, is virtually always, every text is written to somebody. When Paul wrote his letters, he was writing to a particular church. And, and before I figure out what he was saying to that church and how it was reasonably understood by that church, I shouldn't be just gratuitously jumping off into a, a side application that ignores that original intent, uh, because by so doing, I can just open Pandora's box to a thousand different specious interpretations of what may be intended there, which Paul himself or any New Testament author might be appalled to uh, to think that you know we were going there with that text. So. It is, it is the proper role. This is called the historical grammatical method of hermeneutics, which says, first thing, figure out what it meant to the original audience. Then, second thing, ask how, given that understanding, that original understanding, hmm. can I legitimately apply it in my own situation? I think if that procedure is followed, it cures a thousand different heresies and uh, you know, wow. really, really keeps us on a a more uh, sane and proper track of understanding the Bible. Oh, no, that's, that's a great way to put it. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll put it like this, that asking you, what is it, what a passage means to me is not a bad question or not even a wrong question, but not the first question. Yes, that's right. Exactly. No. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about you. You've used the term preterism. I've used that a little bit. Uh, I know a lot of people that don't like the term because it has, I don't know. There's just something something about it that, that sometimes <laughs> rubs people the wrong the wrong way. Yeah. Um, but within that, within preterism, and I remember when I was getting to know you, and it, and you were, you were fairly early on when I was going through different things. You gave me a couple of really good suggestions. Um, David Chilton's Paradise Restored mm -hmm. and some other things to read. But I remember after I had read some of that, and I was understanding a little bit better some of these concepts of taking you know taking those time statements more more at face value. I remember, and I and I loved your answer. I remember saying, "Well, so do you identify as a partial preterist? Do, do you remember what you said in that phone conversation?" Well, I uh, I think I my st my standard answer is I I don't technically you would say yeah I'm a partial preterist, but I I think I said I don't like the term partial preterist. I don't like the term partial anything when it comes to me. I like to be a hundred percent for Jesus. That's what yep. I am. I don't want to be partial, you know, in, in anything. And I think sometimes people here partial preterist and they get the idea that you're sort of waffling out there somehow but right. you know the term preterist itself is a is a term that simply means past uh and and that's a simple meaning and so when you take a preterist approach to a text in scripture then you're basically asking the question is this something that's being described which 
which is describing events that took place in the past. So a preterist approach to Revelation would say that by far most of the book, and some would say all the book, was, was really describing events that took place in the past, that is to say, in the first century. Uh, and the Olivet Discourse, you could say the same thing. Uh, and so when Jesus says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things are fulfilled, on the face of it, he would be insisting on a preterist approach to the Olivet Discourse because he's telling us that these things were going to take place when that generation was still around and it's not referring to events in the distant future. Mm -hmm. There are two species, as you're well aware, of, of, of the preterist approach. Uh, some take the, the approach that's called partial preter, preterism, which says that the prophetic material in the New Testament is largely uh, describing events in the first century, but not exclusively so so that uh, there is still um, a final chapter in human history. Human history has a terminus that is still in our future. That would be the view reflected in the classical creeds of the church. He sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, until he will come to judge the living and the dead. Well, if you're, if you're making that statement in church today, then you're still referring to things that you understand to be in the future. Uh, whereas a full preterist would say, no, that all of the prophetic events that are described in the New Testament are describing first century events, including what is commonly called the second coming. That the second coming is actually uh, took place in 70 AD when Jesus, the son of man, returned on the clouds of heaven, as he himself said, and brought about the destruction of Jerusalem and the termination of the old covenant. And that at that point, you would say everything that the New Testament predicted uh, with respect to the cataclysms related to the end times is actually the end times of the Old Covenant era. I don't hold to that view. Uh, I think that there, and there's several reasons for that. One is just philosophically, I'm uncomfortable with history not going anywhere anymore. It seems to me that a gradual idea of growth without a terminus uh, at its end uh, means growth becomes nonsensical, that, that there has to be some measure by which progress is gauged, and that suggests some kind of end. So philosophically, you know, aside from what the, new, the, the Bible may teach specifically, I'm just uneasy with the notion that there's not a, a, a final uh, sort of culminating moment uh, it also, uh, I have, there's various texts of scripture. Revelation 20 speaks of a thousand years. Uh, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 10 speaks of um, uh, seven thunders. And uh, John is told specifically, it's a very odd text, but it's there for a reason. John is told, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. Well, the phrase seal up, is borrowed from Daniel. Daniel was told the same thing, seal up this revelation you're beginning because it's referring to somewhere out in the distant future. In Daniel's case, it was something like 500 years in the future. Yeah. When, when John is told to seal up what certain voices have said uh, and don't write them down, then it seems that on the face of it, it suggests that Although much of Revelation is describing events that were going to take place within the time frame of those who were then living, not all of it. So seal it up. It's referring to something, at least on the face of it, it would apply out in the future. The fact that Jesus says, uh, gives the instruction, uh, or Paul actually in 1 Corinthians 11, when he's talking about the Lord's Supper, um, uh, you know, do this in remembrance of me until I come, until I come. Well, does that refer to the coming in, in 70 AD? And if so, does that invalidate the sacraments from that point on? Uh, it's, you know, some would say, well, it doesn't necessarily do that, but certainly it's an odd thing to say if, if, uh, if there wasn't some kind of significance to the coming that would terminate the sacraments. Well, even full preterists don't typically say the sacraments are no longer valid. Uh, they would say we continue doing it, and that would imply, therefore, there's still a coming that's out there. You know, there's detailed stuff in the New Testament that I 
a kind of choke on when I'm looking at full preterism. I, I did look at it cons- very uh, sympathetically some years back. There's a major book. I'm sure you've read it. You at least are familiar with it by uh, Stuart. What's the name? Uh, J-, J. Stuart Russell. Yeah, J. Stuart Russell, right, uh, entitled Perusi. I read that book quite carefully all the way through, start to finish. This was probably 15 years ago. Uh, and and I was certainly um, impressed. It's a, it's a very well-written and compelling piece of work in which he argues for a full preterist point of view. But I have to say, even then, I, I came up a little bit um, uneasy with at least some of the ways he treated some texts. I felt like it was a little bit of special pleading there, kind of going beyond what a sensible interpret. It was almost like his presuppositions demanded that he view certain texts a certain way, which would not be the way you'd normally view them. The most recent edition of that, by the way, was the preface was written by R.C. Sproul, who was not a full preterist. But he was very uh, cordial to to Russell, and and uh, but he himself allowed in his in his uh, in his forward to it that uh, uh, he thought they'd gone a little too far at some certain points. So anyway, uh, that you know that's the long and short of it. I, I I'm still in that partial preterist status uh, at this point. So that's sure uh, find out. Sure, and and one thing I appreciate it, and um, and I just wanted to clarify too, and when I talk to you in person a little bit that. You, you were, and this is a compliment, but a little unusual in that a lot of people I've encountered that because I take more of the full predator's position and a lot of people would have and, and would, would consider me to be a heretic or other people to take that position. And I think you said you did not consider that position to be heretical. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I, I don't. I, I, I've, I think it depends on how you define heresy because some people would say heresy is any deviation from what are called the classical ecumenical creeds of the church, which are generally understood to be the first seven creeds, beginning with Nicaea, uh, Chalcedon, uh, Constantinople. Uh, there's, a, there's a family of creedal statements that throughout history, people of all branches of the Christian movement have embraced. So Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, uh, there's no deviation on, on embracing those with the exception of full preterists, you see. So, you know, if someone is defining heresy as deviating from, from those classical creeds, then that, that's, you know, just that's the way it is. But right. in terms of using the statement as a pejorative, I mean, some of the most sincere Christian people I know are full preterists. So I'm, it's not like I'm writing them off as, uh, as uh, so far from, from uh, the, 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 rev- the, the reservation here that, you know, <laughs> have any fellowship anymore so i don't take that view as a practical matter but as a technical matter if if the term is defined in that way which is the way some people do define it then uh it puts you in an awkward position in terms of those creeds so I sure guess. no what no really really well really really well said well bruce i want to um, i've just got a couple more more questions here to kind of wrap up with yeah. um and i hope we you know there's there's so much more love to talk about, so maybe maybe we can do it again sometime oh, sure. too. Yeah, you bet. But uh, are there any um, particular resources that you would recommend, um, either your own resources or other books, blogs? But one time I was doing a video and I said uh, blogs, vlogs, and I said, I said clogs. I think it was tired <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So, but anything for people who want to study these issues more deeply that that you think would be helpful. Yeah, you know, um, uh, of course, the, the, the book that was very helpful to me, you mentioned uh, David Chilton's uh, Paradise Restored, which was written, I think, back in the 80s. Uh, about half that book is a kind of freewheeling uh, survey of revelation. Later, he wrote another book entitled Days of Vengeance, which is a much more thoroughgoing and detailed treatment of revelation. And that's, that's worth reading. The problem is it's out of print. And it's yeah. uh, it's difficult to find, but the publisher, uh, who, uh, Gary North is his name. He's not with us anymore, but the publishing company is. So if a person goes online and just you know Google's um, uh, "Days of Vengeance" by David Chilton, you can actually get a a, uh, a PDF of that book for free. You know, so it's it's actually uh, maybe more available if you don't mind reading it on a computer screen than it was earlier. 
Um, there are others. I, I Gary Demar, uh, acquaintance of mine and a uh, well known in this uh, world is, uh, um, and and you know I he's he's certainly been toying very seriously with full preterism, and some people would would say that he is in fact one. I've talked to him personally more than once on the topic, and he's cagey. That's what I'm going to say. I love Gary, <laughs> a wonderful guy, uh, but he's he's. Yeah, he's a little bit, uh, he plays it close to the vest. And so, you know, I, I still am not quite sure where to wind up on that. But anyway, he's certainly sympathetic to it. But he wrote a book, uh, it's out in a, at least a second edition, maybe a third edition called uh, Last Day's Madness. Yeah. And, uh, and for someone who just wants a kind of, uh, well, very readable, accessible, not highly technical book that is a good introduction to the the question of how we have come to view ourselves as living in the end times and some of the fallacies that are associated with that outlook. It's a very good book. And I, I reread it not that long ago. Uh, and I have to say, I was more impressed on my second reading with it. Of course, I think I've read the second edition and it's a lot more expansive. So uh, anyway, that's a good resource. I think it's worth, uh, worth reading. Ken Gentry has some great uh, material out there. Uh, before Jerusalem fell, he argues for an early date for Revelation. Um, the, the, I think it's called the Beast of Revelation is another one in which he really examines in some detail the number 666 and ties it uh, to Nero. Uh, I think that's probably the correct connection. So those are good books. There's other materials out there, but that would get a person at least going. On okay. that, I've not written anything. I've got YouTube lectures. That's it. The only book I've written is called Historical Context of the Bible. It has virtually nothing to do with eschatology. It's more an attempt to uh, really triangulate Bible history against the backdrop of, of widely accepted world history and, and try to draw connections between what we run into in the Bible and what we otherwise run into in, in uh, ancient historical sources. But, uh, but I... I'm a one book per lifetime guy, you know, I, that, that took it out of me right there. So I'm a, I'm a better <laughs> talker than a writer, but anyway, uh, so well, those I, are some courses. And I would just recommend to people too, that if they, you know, if you go to Bruce's um, YouTube page, uh, that series apocalypse in space and time. Um, and there's one, I think it's number 10 where you, you kind of do an overview of revelation, but there are other things there too, that are good. Um, and just I, I learned so much from you just just you know tracing the history of some of these things. So I yeah. do recommend that people go take a look at that. Um, we have do you have any final final thoughts for us? Well, you know, I just I guess and kind of a minor point that that series you mentioned, Apocalypse in Space and Time, came out in. Uh, I did the original uh, series, ten lectures, some years before I did the rest of it. Uh, and my original intent had been to do maybe maybe 12 or 13 lectures and have about three weeks left to do a summary, kind of a rapid fire summary of Revelation. And the church changed the schedule that year. I had nothing to do with it, but they just <laughs> clipped off the last three weeks or so that I thought I would have. And so I had to hurry up and get all of Revelation summar summarized in one lecture. Wow. That was that 10th lecture. And I was frustrated by that. I think in God's providence, it was uh, it was good that it happened because that put a bee in my bonnet that someday I was going to come back and do Revelation right. And so beginning with lecture 11, which came out some years later uh, through the rest of the series, through lecture 60, you know, I, it was a verse by verse treatment of Revelation. So uh, that's the original title was Apocalypse in Space and Time, because I was in the first 10 lectures only describing in a summary way some of the way the major theories that had come out in church history as to how revelation was understood. Uh, the historicist approach, the futurist approach, uh, the idealist approach uh, and, and so on, you know, all of those and I never really got a chance to jump in and, and do much with the view that I happen to take. So, so I was glad to come back sometime later and try to do that right. So anyway, that's a footnote to the comment on that series on YouTube. Okay. There. okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, appreciate the interview. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Part of this is just 
you know, personal for me, but I, I appreciate you not thinking that people believe things I do are, are completely, um, I don't remember the <laughs> term you use, but I haven't completely there's, there's gone. Still gone. Hope, there's still hope for you. You know, I'm not... <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I've learned a lot from you. And again, I hope uh, listeners will check out your page again. You said, you know, 10 million views, 53,000 uh, subscribers plus. And um, so you're going to get just a great wealth of knowledge there. So anyway, thanks, Bruce. And I hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you, Joel.